So first of all, thank you very much for everybody uh, to everybody for joining the call today uh, for this webinar that Grow Asia is running with the Springfield Center, uh, specifically looking at lessons on achieving impact at scale using rubber in Indonesia as a lens to talk about this. Uh, before we get into the webinar proper, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, as is normally the case, try to log off and then log back on again. That usually fixes issues. If not, please feel free to send your questions to me. So that's Prana Siddhaputra, uh, and I will help you at the back end. If you could also rename yourself uh, so that the format has your full name in brackets, the organization you're from, similar to what you can see I've done just so that we all know where uh, who is on the call. And if you have questions that come out throughout the webinar, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom center of your screen. Uh, we won't, we'll try not to use the chat function to ask questions just because it's easier to consolidate in one place. So that would be sincerely appreciated. We had about 120 people register for the webinar. So we're expecting about 60 people. Uh, to attend today in person. Uh, so I look forward to your active participation. Uh, I, before I move on to the agenda, I just want to say that we will be recording this session and we will send you all the slides. So please, uh, no worries there. Uh, yeah, so quick run through. We will of course have some opening rounds from Grow Asia, And the main focus of the, of the um, webinar today is on a summary of the case study Grow Asia commissioned the Springfield Center to do on PT Kirana Negatara in Indonesia, sustainable rubber. That will take the bulk of the, of the session, followed by uh, uh, comments from Kirana Negatara on what they're doing moving ahead. Uh, the Global Platform for Natural Sustainable Rubber will then also provide some commentary on what's happening at the international landscape. And we have uh, Mars here to talk about how the lessons from this case study are relevant to other commodities as well. And we have carved out ample time for Q&A. So I do encourage you to ask questions. Before I hand over to Graham to give the opening remarks, we do have two quick polls. We want to ask people just to get a feel of who's on the call. So you should see two questions on your screen. Number one is what type of organization do you represent? And the second is how familiar are you with rubber, rubber value chains? So I'll give people maybe about 30 seconds to, to respond to those two questions. Okay, so we're about 65, 70% of respondents. Perfect, so I'm gonna end the poll now. And as you can see, there's quite a mix. Uh, unfortunately, not that, not, well, no one, nobody from a farmer organization, which is unusual for us, uh, but very happy to see the uh, private sector, uh, multilateral organizations, as well as CSOs, NGOs, and academia represented in the room. And we can see that there's also a very broad mix in terms of how much people know about the rubber value chain. So I, I think this call will be quite fruitful because it does go into uh, quite a lot of explanation from the basics to things that are a bit more technical. So with that, I will hand over to Graham Dixie, the Executive Director of Grow Asia, to provide his opening remarks and provide some context as to why we are doing this. Graham, after you. Thanks, Brilliant Nav, and a big, warm welcome to all of you online. Um, thank you for coming and I hope this is going to be a constructive and useful hour and a half. We at Grow Asia are a service organization and one of the things that we definitely do is to keep um, feedback loops about what do people who join Grow Asia, what do they want from us, why do they join? Uh, and they always come back with the same, pretty well the same kind of answers, which is the first one is that they want to learn. And, and with the sense we have here is that this is people wanting to learn how do you do things. They don't want to make expensive mistakes. The second thing is that they want to meet and interact with new partners. And this is, again, an opportunity for that to happen. Um, and, and so we, we spend a lot of effort in this learning process. Um, and one of the things that strikes us is, is so much of the 
the work that is done is done by academic institutions or researchers who tend to have a hypothesis and they set out uh, how they're going to test to see whether this particular value chain works or that particular value chain, but it's based on what their, their uh, research criteria and their methods. What we do is something which has been emerging strongly out of the social sector, which is that actually it makes much more sense to base your research and findings on practice-based research. This is finding out on the ground the way that different people are operating and distilling from it the learning. Um, we, we have 520 partners. There's 46 different working groups. They are at, there are about 50 different sub-projects at different stages of design, piloting, and implementation. And what we do is that up to, um, in the first stage, most of the reporting on those is, is um, self-reporting. But once the project is sufficiently mature, we release uh, an independent consultant to go in and to look at those particular projects and to do two things. One, well, three things actually. One is to, to outline the process and how it happened. The second one is to verify the numbers. Um, uh, and the, the third one is to distill from it the learnings. Uh, and we've now looked at about eight, we've done eight case studies. And what's interesting out of those is about half of them um, uh, either fail or they only move the needle for a few hundred farmers. Um, and, and this indicates to us how difficult it is to get these things right. This is, there is an assumption that if you've got partners working together, it will work. It's not like that. It's much more difficult. What we find is about uh, a quarter of them do pretty well. And, and that is that they change the lives and the behavior and they put more additional funds into the pockets of farmers. And it's normally in the range of 10 to 30,000 farmers. And then there's another quarter which is super successful. And they, by working nationally or working regionally, um, or by bringing in lots of different partners, can really change the lives of, of you know, somewhere between, uh, the range there is between 50,000 farmers and 150,000 farmers. So that's the scale. Um, and that, that's why we do these things. And so that's why we brought in um, consultants to look in detail at what can we learn from this rubber situation. And, and this one is particularly difficult because we certainly know, having distilled out of those into a learning document, what works, what's nice to have, and what fails, what makes it really difficult is when you've got falling prices. And this is the situation that the rubber story has got. But uh, I mean, just to go back to, um, there was a very good book, I thought, by Daniel Pink called Drive, What Motivates People in Work? And he said that there were three things that motivated people in work. One was mastery. They wanted to do. They wanted um, to do their job better, and this is what we're trying to provide here: is is to exchange the learnings to enable us all to do our jobs a little bit better. The second one was autonomy, and and the third one was a sense of purpose. And I think that that is the the third piece here: that we all have a sense of purpose of trying to improve the livelihoods of the smallholder farmers struggling in difficult circumstances in rubber. And what we need to try and take away from that is. What are the lessons from this experience? How can we do things better? So I pass that back to you, Pranav. Thank you, Graham, for contextualizing why it is that we're running this webinar today, and of course, why we produced the case study with the Springfield Center. Um, talking about the Springfield Center, I'd like to hand over then to Rob Hitchens, who's the director of Springfield Center, and Daniel Stialan Nugraha, who's a senior technical advisor with Swiss Contact Worldwide, the two of three people who are responsible for drafting this case study with us. Uh, and so, Rob, over to you. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks, Pranav. Uh, greetings from uh, Kuala Lumpur. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Rob from the, the Springfield Center. We're a, a consulting uh, research and training firm focusing on the development of inclusive markets. Uh, I'm, I'm based in Malaysia. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Daniel Nugra and also uh, Yogi, who did the uh, fieldwork for this case study, are, are based in Indonesia and will be joining us today as well. Uh, if you could move on, please, for now. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank first uh, Karana and Graysia for collaborating so openly to examine this initiative to promote inclusion and sustainability in the rubber value chain. <clears throat> and rubber in Indonesia is a sensible candidate for promoting a more inclusive, sustainable value chain. 
<clears throat> it's uh, it's large. It involves lots of small farmers, and it underperforms. Um, Indonesia supplies about 27% of, of the world's natural rubber. Um, it's uh, Indonesia's second largest agricultural export after palm oil. 85% of the cultivation is by smallholders. Uh, that's about 2.25 million farmers and about a quarter of a million farm workers as well, um, all of whom who have working practice and conditions that are suboptimal. Uh, productivity in the sector is about 50 to 70 percent lower than regional competitors, about one ton per hectare. Uh, and as Graham mentioned, uh, prices, farm gate prices and international prices have, have, have stagnated or fallen, although demand for rubber remains uh, positive. Although this experience has not been entirely successful, uh, we feel it highlights some important factors that can help or hinder the achievement of lasting inclusive impact at scale in value chains. And I guess my key message is that inclusive, sustainable business must be treated as a business first and foremost. Environmental and social objectives can only be achieved and maintained if the underpinning business is profitable for all parties in the value chain. Now, I know that's not a, a complicated message, but it does seem that that message can get lost when business, corporate social responsibility and development people get together. I'd also like to say that this experience is not unique to Kirana uh, or to the rubber sector or Indonesia. Uh, we've encountered similar kind of uh, situations and outcomes in agribusiness sectors across the Asia Pacific uh, region, in Africa, in Latin America, and to some extent, it also mirrors lessons in effective supply chain development from non-agricultural industries. For now, if you could move on one. Thanks. I won't go into detail uh, about the, uh, the value chain, uh, other than to say it's export-oriented, uh, smallholder-based. Most farmers supply factories via networks of commercial intermediaries called uh, suppliers. Uh, and you know, the value chain is influenced positively and negatively by a range of other supporting functions and rules. Uh, Karana's basic model um, is, and supported by development organizations, SNV and GIZ in, in, in different variants, was essentially to develop farmer champions, which were cooperatives, farmer groups, that could train farmers and coordinate their sales of rubber to Karana factories. So via Farmer Champions, farmers received the one-off package of seedlings and other inputs and training. Uh, the Farmer Champions received a, a volume-based commission from factories for bringing more farmers into the network. So the aim of this initiative was to raise farmers' productivity and, and quality uh, and increase farm gate prices also by lowering transaction costs, cutting out value chain inefficiencies. Factories would benefit from increased supplies of rubber and farmer champions would benefit from... Uh, should also point out that Karana uh, received um, some corporate social responsibility support from Pirelli, Goodyear and Michelin for off uh, value chain activities in, in education, health and community empowerment. So the initiative aimed to benefit 9,000 uh, farmers or so. Uh, we didn't find it easy to accurately assess results because monitoring mainly focused on tracking activities, not measuring outcomes. Um, however, we found that while farmers had improved practices and yields to some extent, impact on their incomes was, was negligible. Uh, the picture's a, a bit complicated. Farmer champions had received commissions, but only negligible amounts. Farmer champions lacked capacity and incentives to organize rubber sales to factories. And I don't think that's too surprising. You know, trading requires specific competencies and resources, and not every uh, farmer champion trained uh, is able to perform the function. So there were a few gains in, 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 in trading efficiency. Farmers stuck with what they know. They preferred to sell via their usual suppliers because they received cash on delivery uh, and, and often financial advices or, or in-kind loans. Also, suppliers tended not to differentiate on quality, so farmers uh, didn't receive higher prices or premium payments for better quality, so that also discouraged farmers. 
while we were doing the study, though, we, we also looked at a, another unrelated uh, scheme, uh, unrelated in the sense of outside of Karana, uh, which was known as UPPB, um, roughly translated Rubber Processing and, and Marketing Units, which operate under the Ministry of uh, Agriculture. This scheme hasn't achieved scale because of inherent management and governance weaknesses within, uh, within, within the scheme. But we found that participating farmers had achieved higher quality and farm gate prices than their peers. So the UPBB model seems to be getting something right, at least in terms of functions, if not in organizations. Specifically, that was a focus on improving quality, dry rubber content rather than volumes. Uh, it was screening shipments for quality compliance, in other words, increased uh, or, or an appropriate level of dry rubber content against which farmers received premium payments. Uh, it stipulated uh, and supplied formic acid as a, as a coagulant, which is important in, in, in increasing dry rubber content and provided some agriculture, uh, some technical information. Um, the UPBB itself doesn't handle transport and so forth. That's handled by suppliers who, who buy at farmers output via auctions. So, it, wasn't uh, an untrammeled success. So to move on to the factors that hampered impact, um, the most vital one goes back to something Graham mentioned, which was motivation. Uh, understanding the incentives that either drive or inhibit investment behavior change uh, and improve performance. Stagnated prices undermine everyone's motivation to invest, that's clear, but particularly for farmers. And the frank reality is that the status quo doesn't make commercial sense for most smallholders. The official poverty line in Indonesia is uh, US dollars 30 a month or so. Uh, a construction worker working 10 days a month typically earns about $32 a month. A palm oil farmer with a similar size holding earns around about $70 a month. Uh, a typical rubber farmer earns about $19 a month. So why invest? Farmers pursue a, a, a risk averse sensible strategy of low input, low yield, low returns. And this vicious cycle is causing farmers to, to leave the sector to pursue more profitable prospects. The, the, uh, the quality driven UPPB model um, seems to have been successful in, in pushing up quality, uh, increasing uh, dry rubber content to 45% from an average of 35% and tended to generate higher returns, somewhere in the region of 60 to $90 a month, depending on the prevailing price. But I think the key point is that Kurana's model didn't really work with or alter the incentives of farmers. It, it, it was really promoting more of the same. So some questions I'm going to pose that perhaps we can come back to uh, in discussions later. We've seen in this case, but more generally, that a lot of inclusive business initiatives focus on training to fix the farmer. But do farmers really have the incentives to upgrade on their own? Another question would be, is it just farmers' practices that need to change? With farmers exiting the sector and factories closing, what are the incentives of buyers, factories and suppliers to maintain supplies of rubber? A second factor, uh, which is, either undermines or promotes success, seems to be whether an inclusive business initiative builds on or bypasses existing value chain actors and functions. Like many initiatives, Karana's approach didn't engage sufficiently with existing intermediaries who handle 99% of farmers rubber. It's important to recognize that intermediaries often perform important but hidden value adding functions. We've just seen some of them go up on screen. And when, when intermediaries are bypassed, those functions are no longer performed. And there's a long history, starting with fair trade, uh, that ha has, has also uh, experienced this problem. And as I said earlier, the farmer champions tended to lack capacity and incentives to take over these functions. So some of the hopes for efficiency gains didn't materialize, and farmers stuck with their existing suppliers. They stuck with what they know. On the other hand, Suppliers themselves struggle to get enough supply. Some also are exiting the, the sector. So are suppliers motivated to change how they work? Some more questions for us to come back to later. 
the UPBB approach seems at least to have some of the right package of quality driven standards, compliance, quite focused support and, and, and premiums attached to quality, but the wrong delivery mechanism. So could that package of support be adopted through existing supplier networks? Could it be delivered through existing supplier networks? And I guess the key question I'm asking is, is our challenge really to fix the pharma or is it really to make, make buyer, supplier, pharma engagement within the value chain more effective, more efficient, and more commercially viable? Good question. A third factor is ensuring that inclusion and sustainability objectives make commercial sense and are fully integrated and operationalized into core business because it's core business activities and core business personnel that practically determine the deal that farmers get. Karana was completely committed to its sustainability initiative, but we found its objectives were not fully understood by all stakeholders or practically reflected in day-to-day -day operations or the key performance indicators of personnel. Key personnel lack the, the toolkit, if you like, to pursue inclusion and sustainability which farmers to work with, what support package, what kind of performance parameters, incentives make most sense. This disconnection between inclusive and sustainability or CSR objectives and activities and core business is, is not unique to Karana. Pranav, could you just click on for me? Thank you. It's increasingly recognized that inclusion and sustainability objectives are most effectively achieved at scale and in an elastic way when they are fully integrated into core business rather than treated as separate or standalone social or charitable endeavors. I guess I'd say that Karana's approach was somewhere around level two with, with some links between core business and the, the social and inclusion side, but also with, with critical gaps in understanding and, and operationalization. Next slide, please. So areas for improvement. The commercial viability of farming has to be the foundation. If that's not there, the whole supply chain is vulnerable. Uh, and I think a key lesson is it, it's essential to calculate critically, not just assume the profit profitability of smallholder production. Better farming practices require additional time, resources, risk, so the anticipated benefits must justify that additional investment. I think uh, maybe a slightly more con controversial um, consideration is that inclusive, sustainable agribusiness cannot just be a headcount game. It's, it can't simply be about trying to include as many farmers as possible. Not all farmers have the motivation or capacity to upgrade or even remain in farming. It's clear businesses will need to invest more in their supp smallholder supply chains to secure reliable supplies, and they can't afford to spread that investment too thinly. So it seems that business supply chain development and management, pra management practices must become more selective, efficient, and effective. And I think first and foremost, this is going to mean consolidating supplier farmer networks, focusing perhaps on fewer farmers and, and intermediaries, but supporting them in better ways. Once a, a viable farmer supplier buyer business model has been identified, then it can be scaled up. And, and the graphic here uh, is, is just extracted from some work we're doing with, with Mars, and you'll hear from Ibofe later, about trying to, to help look at how you can be more efficient in identifying the right kind of farmer, the right kind of agent, and, and supporting farmers in, in the most efficient way. The other thing that is, is clear is that innovation is going to be needed to increase farmers' returns. How they're supported, how they're incentivized to upgrade. Identifying complementary income streams through polyculture, looking at ways of lowering uh, transaction costs through smarter logistics, transportation solutions, digitization solutions from farmer to factory. But I just want to be clear, 
this is not beating up corporate social responsibility or inclusion, uh, sustainability initiatives or development agencies. They have an important role to play in, in, in transforming uh, the way that supply chain management engages with smallholders. These, are, these initiatives, development agencies can support innovation, uh, they can test new models and they can rigorously measure new ways of, of what works and what doesn't and get, gathering evidence. But ultimately, rolling out these successful interventions is part of the day-to-day -day operations, the transactions of, of core business. Uh, they are the, the costs of, of doing good business uh, and they have to, to be absorbed. Thank you very much. Apologies, I had some trouble unmuting myself. Uh, so thank you very much, Rob, for that uh, overview of the case study, which, by the way, we will be sending to all of you once this webinar is over. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to Widianto uh, Sumarlin or Pawidi from Kirana Megatara to speak at uh, some degree of length as to what Kirana Megatara is doing now moving forward to, to improve the sustainability of their value chains. So, uh, Pawidi, uh, over to you. All right, thank you, Prana. Uh, I'd just like to start by uh, saying that I agree with the uh, conclusion about the need to incentivize the farmers in a way that's embedded in the whole supply chain or even the value chain up to there. Uh, however, I would like also to point out that when the Springfield uh, conducted this survey or study in 2019, it was also a bad year for the rubber industry because uh, 2019, that, that was when most or, uh, of the plantation, especially the smallholders, are affected by the uh, leaf disease. Uh, that there was an uh, epidemic of leaf disease affecting mostly in the uh, South, South, South Sumatra and Jambi area with a production loss of, of 50%. So in terms of Sourcing volume, definitely, with, uh, we take a hit on that time too. But uh, 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 let me just go next to the next slide. I just want to give you a context uh, of what we've been doing. Can you move it? Uh, okay, that here, I just want to show that the, when 10 years ago, uh, Kirana uh, raised the concerns uh, within Kirana about sustainability, it's, we are more thinking more about the risk, business risks. So when we say sustainably risk, it means the continuity of our supply, uh, which are, we're concerned about disruption of that because all of our supply, we got it from the dealers or the traders uh, that, that, that they pick up from the smallholders through several layers there. So we don't have, we don't know uh, what, what will happen uh, if somehow, you know, the smallholders uh, decide to, you know, stop the business, change the business, or what it will, it will affect the supply. And so, also, about the quality of the rubber. Now, this is uniquely Indonesian, that wherever we try to source the rubber from the, the dealers, they're all poor quality rubbers. They're highly contaminated, they're processed in the, in, with the wrong chemicals, and for years, we've been trying to educate the traders on, 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 on what kind of quality we need, but it, it's just uh, fell on deaf ears. So that we know that, it have to, that we need to do something about it, because if we don't, it's actually costly for us. So we have to do, you know, use three times as much of the volume of water to clean it up twice as much of electricity generated to do that. And, and it will be a, just a matter of time before we be competed out of the business by you know, uh, similar processors in Thailand and Malaysia. Um, and only the last few years, I said four or five years ago, that, be, that when we started out to uh, reach out the farmers, then uh, there comes these issues of environmental and social concerns. So we understood that, that the way to do this is to, to, to start out and try to think it uh, in a different way of, of what we're doing. And so if you go to the next slide, Prana, yeah, 
I, I won't go through all of these things, but just want to, to summarize that. But prior to 2010, when we talk about smallholders, it's usually a CSR type, the traditional CSR type activities. We leave it to the independent factories to do their own CSR. Uh, they have a budget to do that and they know what to so it's best in the community. And they usually do it several times a year, uh, mostly along religious holidays or national holidays. Uh, but since, we, since 2010, our orientation be, is different when we talk about the smallholder. It should be part of our business strategy. It should be part of our core activities too. And that's when we started to develop this partnership program and also create this division that's entirely focused on developing partnership with the smallholders here. And we do that also by creating directly partnership with the smallholders without trying to cut off our own supply line. So we leave our existing supply line through the traders intact. It's not, it's, it's, it's bad business for us if we try to mess with that. So we just do this on a voluntary basis. We started small. Now, mind you that nobody has, has been doing that in the industry. They all all relies on doing uh, on getting their their rubber from the small from the traders. So there's no contact between them with the smolders, except for like you know charity type CSR events. And out of that, we tried out several projects. Now, when you talk about the farmer champion project, it's the first project that we try to think about in, incentivize the smolders. It was just a pilot project in 2019. We haven't done that before. It was just start. It was a small. We we tried to do uh, several locations, and the one that we found out to be more uh, uh, positive about is when we uh, collaborate with SNV in the Jambi area. So obviously, practically tried on own, but then doesn't uh, get the kind of result that we get with uh, collaborative with SNV in the Jambi area. So it was just a pilot, and we tried to built on that this year. So we go next, Pranam. Now, the way we address them, uh, because we look at the problems from the, from the small orders perspective. You know, it always starts on the farm. It's also from the planting, uh, the trees. They're, they're settled with the low yield trees or old trees, non-productive trees. And then it goes on to the, the poor technique, uh, uh, tapping techniques. Uh, improper processing, and the next time they, they have problems about the marketing because all they do is just sit there and wait for the collectors to come in and pick it up. There's no other way. So the, the way they deal with the dealers is it's all what they know for generations. And and so the first challenge is to, when we try to address this, we start from the right side. We have to deal with the marketing channel. We have to let them know that if you do transaction with a factory, it's different with the transaction with the dealer. Now, this is, it, it's a hard, it, it's a very uh, time consuming, it's a difficult process to change the mindset. Because when you, when you go into there, the very first time they'll ask is, what kind of price you can give it to me? You know, we have to say, look, uh, that's, that's, we can't guarantee prices all the time, but we tell you how we do it, and we tell you uh, why we do these things, uh, because, it's a, it's a fact uh, in, in many, uh, you'll find it in many dealers or probably this is professor problem too. The scales is the problem. That's one, there's, there's many a problem, but one of them is the scale. Uh, a lot of the dealers, they, they, they bring their own scale to the, to the collection point and the scale is actually not properly calibrated. If you, uh, so there's some quote unquote uh, dishonesty embedded in that, you know, and that's one thing that we teach them from the start. You know, that, that, that's one thing that we have to show them to the factory. And then there's also a myth of saying, you know, it's only the dealers that go to the factory. Even if they live about 50 meters away from our factory, they this myth of, yeah, it's too complicated to go to the factory. When in fact, it's very simple. Of things that we have to, to change their mindset and then we move to the next phase, which is the quality. And then when it comes to productivity, we know it's a long-term project. So we, uh, we understood that the replanting project will be the best one to address that. And we just started just a, a couple of years, actually three, four years ago to, to start thinking about the uh, uh, start 
uh, undergoing a pilot project replanting for our partners. Okay, so next. Uh, so here's the challenge. As I think it's already alluded earlier before, but as we go uh, with this program, right, uh, we, we face the difficulty that if you try to change the behavior uh, of, of, the, of the smallholder and they didn't get the proper reward in return, that's difficult. Uh, and we also face the same thing that if you look at this, I, there's this chart here, it's a chart, the blue one is a chart uh, of the farm gate price, an estimation that I make for across the region. And the red one is the, the, the price of the rice, uh, uh, rural, uh, uh, sold rurally. And you can see that rice is a staple food for all the Indonesians. Uh, and it's also a practical, a rice economy is a practical market. So naturally, the price of the rice keeps increasing year by year. And you end up at a point uh, a few years, uh, since a few years ago until now, that, that all the smolders are striving to make ends meet uh, compared to like 10 years ago. So this is, this is a challenge, I think, in all the systemic model that, that, that uh, uh, addressing environmental and social has to also include uh, uh, some mechanism for the for the uh, the uh, small orders to get a resilient income, I think it's something that's echoed by by earlier one. So we, as an off taker, uh, can't escape with this. So we have to deal with this thing. Now. Um, next, right? But for us, we look at the positive. For once, uh, you see uh, nowadays we have a twenty percent of our supply land consists directly from the, from the smallholders. Well, 10 years ago, there was practically none, zero. So we have, and then that, that is not cutting or bypassing the intermediaries, our own intermediaries. That's completely a new kind of sourcing there. And, uh, uh, and it's, I, I believe uh, no other processor in this has done quite like us in here. Um, and now we have members that's growing uh, about 300, you know, there, there's some desertion, but there's also we get more. You, you can't always hope that this will come to success, but it takes time to, to develop this thing. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, in the future, we know the, the world uh, rubber uh, demand will pick up after this pandemic event. I think the, the worst part of it has passed as, as tire uh, manufacturers all around the world as startup uh, production, although not quite the level they have before. There's also consolidation in the processor industry. I think in Indonesia, you see many, some that started to go belly up and there's also consolidation among, uh, consolidation among the existing ones. The UPP model is on the rest. UPP structure has been there since more than 10 years ago, it's still 2008. But why is it on the rise? It's part is because of the, uh, the, the, the pricing, the internet price is uh, still depressed. And it's none uh, other than, a, it's actually an auction house uh, uh, model. So that's why it's attractive for the, for the small order. And, and we are supporting of that too. It's, it's, it's complemented. There's still too few of them. It's only 200 across the uh, whole nation and only 100 is active. So, we, but, but, so it's still a lot more that needed for that. Uh, but it's a good model for them to start to try because it's a it's a whoever you know can pay the highest uh, will get it. Uh, the, and then uh, and probably the next speaker in uh, uh, Stefano Savi will will allude to the fact that if there's more awareness that this cannot be done by just one party alone. There has to be a multi-stakeholder approach across the value chain. So what we what we do at Kirana is we keep running the core of the program, right? So we are we focus more in increasing the livelihood, whatever uh, means or activities that we think we can raise the livelihood. It doesn't mean just to raise the revenue by prices, but also how to uh, reduce the cost of of production, even their cost of living. So we have to start to think like an intermediate trader, but not. We are not an intermediate trader. So there are some parts of that that we can try to emulate. Yeah. 
And we are getting more and more collaboration with our, with our buyers in, in preferring this because uh, we realize that there has to be some incentives built in also to our customers. I mean, what do we get, you know, by creating uh, sustainable natural rubber? What is a sustainable natural rubber? What does that mean? How do you how do you price that thing? And lastly, uh, we like more UPP. I think part of the UPP is already in, in the Kirana supply chain, although we don't deal with them directly. But uh, as they grow, uh, they can become part of the uh, existing supply chain. I think that's about uh, my wrap up on here. Uh, so I uh, got go back to you, Pranav. Thank you so much, Pawidi. And it's really nice to see that uh, Kirana Megatara has really actually changed your how you operate in terms of increasing the sustainability of your natural rubber supply chains uh, in quite a rapid amount of time. And hopefully in a couple of years, we can do another case study and see, <laughs> see where this has taken you to. And so with that, I'd like to invite Stefano Savi, who's the director for uh, the GPMSR, so the Global Platform for Natural Sustainable Rubber, to provide some commentary on the international landscape for <clears throat> sustainable natural rubber. And so, uh, Stefano, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav. So, uh, GPSNR is a global platform for sustainable natural rubber. And if you can go to the next slide directly. Before, before I'll go to the... Um, uh, to the discussion around the uh, the outcomes of the of the case study, I wanted to give you a bit of an, uh, uh, a background information about GPSNR. So GPSNR, the Global Platform for Sustainable Natural Rubber, was uh, started in 2018 uh, with support from a group uh, called the Tire Industry Project. Uh, this is a group of 11 tire makers that have been working on. Uh, uh, issues, sustainability issues around uh, uh, tire production, including natural rubber, uh, for a number of years now under the auspices of the World Business Council for Sustainable uh, Development. So uh, GPSNR started in Singapore um, with funding from TIP, but is now fully uh, independent. And uh, uh, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative that has uh, uh, members uh, around different uh, stages of the supply chain in natural rubber, from producers, processors, to tire makers and other buyers, uh, to the car makers and downstream users, as well as having uh, participation from civil society in, uh, um, in the organization. And uh, GPSNR has a mission to define sustainability for the natural rubber uh, supply chain. Yeah, so next. Um, Despite being quite young, I would say 15 months of operation, the membership of GPSNR has grown uh, pretty rapidly. We now have 90 members in GPSNR. Uh, Kirana, as you can see, is one of our members in the producers, processors and traders category. And since the beginning, GPSNR has worked painstakingly to ensure that there's inclusion of smallholders in our membership. At the moment, about a third of our membership is uh, 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 formed by independent smallholders. Uh, we have 27 uh, smallholders that are coming from seven different countries uh, that are part of the GPSNR. One other important point I will say about the, um, about the membership of the platform is that we, if we look at the producers, processor and traders category, we cover about 30% of global production of natural rubber. Uh, if we look at the tire makers uh, sector, we have about 50% of uh, um, global rubber volume uh, within the uh, platform membership. So this means quite a vast coverage of the overall global market. Next. So I think a lot has been said about the challenges in natural rubber, but I uh, just wanted to, uh, to, to uh, recap uh, what uh, um, is the, uh, what are the key elements of the uh, supply chain and how it's uh, constituted? Because I think that's what will help us really understand what are the solutions for the challenges that we have. So um, rubber, as many of you may know, is a key ingredient in tires and in uh, uh, many other products, but especially in tires. 
70% of global production of natural rubber goes into tires. So it's quite a bottleneck uh, of the supply chain, especially considering that uh, there's been quite a conglomeration in the tire industry and there's not so, that many players uh, out there. Um, this said, the production base of natural rubber is very spread out. Um, I think Rob mentioned before that 85% of uh, production in uh, Indonesia is uh, coming from smallholders, and that's a figure that is valid for uh, globally as well. And we have six to seven million farmers working on, on rubber. So when we talk about uh, uh, traceability and transparency in the supply chain, we understand what the challenges are. We have a, a clear understanding of consumption, but when we look at production, it's very difficult to, to go back to the single farm. Um, also, we know that with, with growing demand, uh, of course, this year is a particular year, but uh, the rubber market has been growing in demand quite steadily. And the expectation is for this to, uh, to pick up again, as uh, it is said uh, before. Um, this uh, growth in demand will also come with uh, a growth in the sustainability challenges. Yeah. Uh, not only uh, from a, a, an environmental and, uh, and, uh, and social point of view, but also from an economic point of view in ensuring that the livelihoods of uh, uh, smallholders and producers are uh, maintained. And with that, I'll go to my next slide. So these are some of the sustainability issues that we've, uh, we've seen in natural rubber. And uh, uh, we see the economic, on the economic side, we have uh, uh, also the other speakers spoke about the low income for farmers, the fluctuation of prices, and generally speaking, the lack of equity uh, in the supply chain and uh, uh, ensuring that there's no inequities in the distribution of, of wealth uh, along the supply chain in different stages. Uh, from a social perspective, uh, we have farmers in different regions that are still uh, lacking uh, decent living and working conditions. Uh, we're not only speaking uh, about farmers that are working in, uh, in uh, uh, larger plantations, but also about independent uh, smallholders. And this comes with the uh, uh, risks uh, around uh, labor rights and, and gender equality as well. Of course, also from an environmental perspective, and especially when uh, uh, in the years where prices uh, called for an expansion of the business. We have seen uh, issues around deforestation and loss of biodiversity. And uh, uh, in general, uh, when we uh, look at poorly managed plantations, uh, one of the key issues in, in uh, rubber is also the management of water and water stewardship uh, and more in generally resource management. So I have a question here for the audience and uh, I hope Pranav can help me put that up on screen and asking you, what do you think uh, of the following is the most pressing challenge in natural rubber now? Economic, social, environmental, or others? Okay, we have about 60% of the people responded. We'll try to hit 70 if it's possible for people who have not voted. Almost there, we're so close, just a few more people. Perfect, great, thank you. Thanks. So I guess the, the answer reflects, uh, and I hope everyone can see it on screen, right, Pranav? Um, the, answer, yeah. the answer reflects the, the uh, state of the uh, natural rubber supply chain and, and economy at the moment, yeah? Uh, we've had, uh, especially if you speak to producers, if you speak to rubber smallholders, it's clear that the economic side of it is uh, a very pressing issue that we must uh, confront. Yeah? Um, I see that environmental and uh, uh, social challenges are still out there on the agenda, and I think it's important that we keep also those in mind uh, and making sure that while we uh, try and find solutions for the economic uh, challenges, we don't do this and uh, inadvertently create social and environmental challenges uh, coming up again in the future. So uh, it's, it's good that we have that understanding and I think that comes up from the uh, case study as well. So if you can go to the uh, next slide, please. So we've, we've seen in the, uh, in the case study what the issues are, yeah, that are uh, faced by, um, uh, by Kirana. 
And I think these issues are not uncommon uh, with uh, other uh, producers in natural rubber, but also in other commodities, especially when we talk about uh, 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 tropical um, agricultural commodities. Yeah. Uh, so we have issues uh, that are surrounding the uh, ability of uh, uh, members to really define targets for sustainability on around these three pillars and define targets to uh, close the gaps uh, on the different challenges that we have assessed. And uh, um, what I think is uh, an advantage of uh, uh, coordinating these activities and designing these, challenge, these, these uh, uh, targets through um, a coordinated industry action is that we can uh, really uh, have different players around the uh, supply chain work on a level playing field. And understanding what is the target together means that we can uh, better measure it, we can better monitor it and better achieve it. Yeah? Um, another point uh, of uh, um, advantage is that we have seen what, um, what can happen uh, when the companies don't have control about their ability to design financial incentives. Yeah? It's very difficult for a company unilaterally to do so uh, when, when they uh, are facing uh, issues such as uh, uh, competitors uh, having uh, free, free riders uh, opportunities yeah? and, uh, and leaders have uh, disadvantages of being first movers. And this is where uh, really organizations like GPSNR can help. And this is some uh, part of the work that we're doing in GPSNR to uh, look at the financial model that, uh, uh, for example, through uh, contribution based on uh, uh, trades, yeah, on uh, tonnage of trades of natural rubber that go to cover the um, uh, cost of uh, the externalities on the market will uh, allow the uh, different players that are members of GPSNR to uh, face together the uh, costs that are brought up by, for example, having a standard around uh, uh, living income and, and living wages. Yeah. Uh, and this is where uh, we have already started working on uh, a review of the financial model, uh, working on the possibility of having uh, volume-based fees as an opportunity in the future, and also looking at uh, uh, what does it mean uh, to uh, really look at the living uh, wage and living income uh, future. And we have a, a subgroup of our strategy and objectives working group in GPSNR, our equity subgroup, that is already working um, on uh, defining what uh, uh, living wage and living income will mean in natural rubber based on an anchor methodology. So, um, as mentioned, some of the challenges that we'll, uh, we'll face, that, uh, that our members will face, are really around uh, making sure that we can uh, balance the need for compliance and the need for incentives when uh, achieving this, uh, that we have an understanding of how we can get people to move together while uh, having to work within the boundaries of antitrust regulation as well. And uh, this is an important part of the discussion, I would say, especially when we talk about uh, financial incentives, because at the moment, uh, antitrust uh, um, laws do not uh, allow, of course, uh, buyers to agree on compensations and how the um, uh, equity uh, must be shared around the supply chain. But there are ways to look into this and there are ways to uh, move forward, yeah? whereby the uh, organization at GPSNR can uh, set some uh, groundwork for uh, companies to benefit and start being uh, leaders in, uh, in this work. So, yeah, uh, that's uh, the end of my presentation. And I think a key message that I would like to send is that really uh, when we look at challenges that uh, companies like Kirana have been facing and when they're trying to solve these challenges, uh, I think there's no other ways but uh, uh, working on collaboration and ensuring that uh, really we look at the uh, challenges that uh, these commodities are facing as industry challenges and not company challenges and we solve them and we're trying to find solutions accordingly. Thank you very much, Stefano. And that's definitely an approach uh, that Grow Asia plays very heavily in. We are, like the GPNSR, op operate as a multi stakeholder partnership platform. So we fully agree with, uh, as you say, that it needs to take an industry approach to solving these challenges. Uh, before I move on to the next speaker, which is uh, Fei Fei Chu, who's the Asia Cocoa Director for Mars, 
I just want to remind everybody that if you have questions, please feel free to add them into the Q&A box and we will make sure that they are addressed during the Q&A section. Uh, if not, we will send the, uh, the questions to the individual speakers directly so that we can eventually get a response to you too. So with that, uh, Fei Chu from the Asia Cocoa Director of Mars, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav. I'll keep my video off until the Q&A. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Grow Asia, for the opportunity to just share a little bit of our learnings from working with uh, smallholder farmers across Asia, uh, Indonesia, as well as uh, Philippines and Vietnam. Um, we are here today to uh, talk, uh, to share some experiences. I think um, everything that Stefano and Kirana talked about, you just need to, you know, the challenges and all that, you just you know, substitute the word rubber for cocoa, and we are in exactly the same position. Uh, and I, I, you know, I welcome this like-minded uh, uh, collaboration that we can learn from each other. Um, I just quickly, Mars is a privately owned business. Uh, we are still family owned and driven by principles. And one of the key principles I'd like to talk about today is mutuality. This was articulated by um, the founder of the business in 1947, and it's fundamentally that only uh, a shared benefit will endure. And Mars has been in the business of making chocolate for 100 years, and we want to continue for the next 100. So um, one of the ways we've articulated this is through the purpose of the organization, uh, which is what you see on the screen today, that the world we want tomorrow really starts with how we do business today. And this is in recognition that the role of business is changing in light of the challenges we are facing in the world, whether it's economic inequity or environmental degradation, but how each of us uh, individually in communities and institutions, including businesses, will have to reconceptualize how the relationships as we move forward. Next. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the, the evolution of where business, and it was good to hear uh, Pawidi talk about where Kirana started as a CSR, and then <clears throat> moving on into this is the business strategy. Um, and um, traditionally, businesses has been about maximizing profits. And the question that we've been posed within Mars was, what is the right level of profit? If we are too much, if it's too much, then something in the system breaks. And we've seen that in numerous, a lot of the agricultural commodities that Mars depends on for our, um, for our business. Um, and so um, I think it's a case of purpose and profit. But then the question becomes, what serves what? Um, is it that, you know, uh, and we came up with the conclusion that actually it's profitable solutions that solves the problems of people and planet. So this concept that doing good and doing well, there's no dichotomy and they serve, at, you know, and, and there's no dichotomy in, in that. Um, so we came to the, I mean, uh, successful smallholders is key to our success and, and working on these challenges collectively is, is the business strategy. I'd like to just point out a little bit on the right. Uh, we started to conceptualize how might we measure different performances uh, outside just financial performance, other capital things like, if we, we will talk a lot about trust. How do we measure trust and social capital, natural capital and other forms of capital that one might create when we, we are working with smallholders? There is a, uh, uh, a forum that's coming up actually in early September. And if anyone, since it's all online, it's available for everyone free of charge. If you want and interested to look at different ways of measuring impact and, and uh, capital, please feel free to uh, uh, sign up on the link provided. Next. So the uh, COCO challenge, similar to rubber as we've just heard, is how do we reach at scale 60,000 Indonesian COCO farmers to adopt the, the we, we call it the triple productivity package. Indirectly, there's about 200,000 farmers today. Uh, next, two times uh, for now. Um, the, uh, the challenge that we face clearly is this, the, uh, Indonesia used to be the number three producer of cocoa in the world outside Ivory Coast and Ghana. And in the last eight years, we've seen a dramatic decline from about the 600,000 to now under 200,000. And in the meantime, we've seen, of course, grind increase because uh, as middle class, uh, particularly in Asia and Middle East and a lot of the emerging markets, uh, you know, develop a, a, a taste for chocolate consumption and GDP uh, consumption typically follows GDP growth. Um, so we have this uh, regional imbalance where we, where we are growing the heaviest is also where we are losing a lot of these supplies. Farmers simply have lost 
uh, have moved out of cocoa for other competing um, options, uh, better crops and better uh, livelihoods elsewhere. Now, at the same time, Mars has invested a lot of uh, uh, in, uh, into science and the plant science of things and understand that actually with the right sort of the, the package uh, of planting material and the right inputs and, and soil management as well as gas, um, we can triple the yields and, and at the end of the day, double the incomes of farmers that may, enables them to then remain and make cocoa a viable livelihood for themselves. And their future generation will also find interest to also continue farming cocoa. Um, if you can move to the next slide. So um, the challenge was scale and, oh, sorry, actually, um, before we go back, uh, can we actually launch the, uh, so th that was the challenge. Um, and then we have a poll at this point. Um, and this was, uh, you know, we, we were struggling with adoption. So when I came into this role about 10 years ago, we did a whole bunch of things. We thought we had the perfect package, but why was adoption so low? We turn it around. And if you can take some time to, it's a bit of a lengthy um, question. Pick top three, you think, are uh, the answers to, um, uh, or the, the opportunities that we saw. And we will spend a bit more time on this question that we have for the other polls. So please take the time to read the question properly. And to reiterate, you can choose up to three choices here. Particularly as we were working in Indonesia, we saw a number of these, uh, what I call the opportunities or the assets that lies within the community. Okay, I hope you've picked your three. How are the answers coming in? Pranav? Really spread out, actually. Uh, can you see the, res the results okay, on your screen? No, I can't. Okay, I'll read them out then, if that's okay. So for high social capital, that is the highest at 54%. Same with strong institutional government support for agriculture initiatives. Um, so both of those are 54. Very closely behind is positive influencers in the community and joint decision making about income, uh, which are at 50% each. Again, very closely behind that is entrepreneurial mindset and uh, tailing behind is desire to help others succeed, which only received 17% of the votes. Okay, thank you. And the answer is actually all of them. And in some cases, uh, we saw in Indonesian communities and agricultural rural communities actually a function of all of those above. And I forgot another one that I only uh, realized I forgot, the youth who are early adopters of technology and adoption and um, clearly also have lots of opportunities. So if we can move to the next slide. So we had this extent, we had this problem, right? We, it wasn't, we, we've trained thousands and thousands of farmers through PPP, um, uh, uh, donor funding to, to 150,000 farmers across Indonesia. We were still not seeing adoption. We were thinking, okay, what's the link between a, a training and adoption? Clearly it wasn't in the training. It was in the fact that for the farmer to make a behavior change and do something and sustain that change, he needed coaching and the last mile solution by someone he trusted. So um, we, and if you can tap again, we, we started this uh, to think, okay, if the assets are within the community, let's tap into that. How about if we privatize the extension and uh, created a business model around it? So this idea and concept of a cocoa doctor came about or a network of cocoa doctors um, around which every kabupaten or district has one cocoa development center having 30 cocoa, uh, cocoa doctors that supports a 3,000 farmer day base. So it's a hub and spoke model. But it was about the key, it was about the business model. So we started these community, I mean, these nurseries where they're run by these entrepreneurial cocoa doctors. Uh, but they're not just in the business of seedlings and inputs. They are given heavy agronomy and business training by the Cocoa Academy. And they then go out and, you know, we talked about looking for the early influencers. They themselves self-select and know which are the farmers in the community that actually is committed to uh, wanting to make a change on their farm. Because they are from within the community and they have this 
trust networks that are already there. But with the business of seedlings and inputs, they did what we wanted to happen, right? Which was the after sales service or essentially the coaching. Uh, this is a picture of our cocoa uh, one of our cocoa doctors from North Kolaka. And he, you know, even despite COVID and all, they are out there talking to farmers, teaching, if it's time to prune the tree, he comes with you and does it. And they do it collectively, Gotong Royong. And the, 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 the concept here is by farmer, for farmer, and they are doing the, the extension as and when it is needed by farmers. So, um, so this idea came and we started on that in about 2012, 13. We started to uh, train networks of cocoa doctors across the four districts that we were working in. If you can move to the next slide. Um, before I go to the results and what happened, um, we talk, uh, we have to understand that there's, uh, the learnings we got is that the, any kind of technology adoption takes this curve, right? You, you, you start with the innovators, early adopters, and as the, there's more uptake and it gets to about the 20, 25% level, then the middle of the curve starts to come in because, you know, humans, we are a little bit of, we, we have that herd mentality. If we see success, yeah, there's more likelihood that we will follow. And then, you know, uh, but I think the key thing here is time. Time is a key factor. It took us five to seven years. And the next slide, I'll show you a little bit what happened with um, where we saw the results. If you can tap twice or once. Okay, twice. So um, remember, we started on this part about, uh, about 2013. We started to train cocoa doctors, set up their businesses and all that. And these are results across many districts in uh, Kabupaten in, in, in Sulawesi, in, in Indonesia. And we were seeing a couple of interesting things. One, we could see the, the adoption level of clones. We were at a high, a high quality superior clones was at three times the national average. We, uh, be, all we did was train these cocoa doctors and help them set up the nurseries. And they, and, and they went in turn to set up others and others and expand it we saw a 13 million annual capacity just in these four uh, areas that we were working in. That creates, uh, you know, that alone, if you think about the annual turnover of seedlings that they are creating and the multiply effect of the wealth in the uh, village, that's about just on pro a turnover, it's 4 million. That equates to about 13,000 hectares of cocoa, right? Um, and then we saw higher gap adoption that came later and we're dealing through some of the challenges as well. Now, the, the point uh, of the matter is, again, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, just want to derive some lessons learned, if you can click twice. There are certain conditions that has to happen at the start. So in our early years of 2012 to about 2015, what did we do? We um, really targeted early adopters. We identified cocoa doctors. We also identified key farmers. We ensured that it was high quality, visible success. So one of the, 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 the wow farms, the, you know, the current hectare uh, average uh, yield was about 0.5, but we were going for a two ton per hectare. Uh, the wow farm and the visible effect of it had to be very visible, strategically located in different villages so that it was, you know, and we measured the, and, and ensured that that happened. We did a lot of foundational work, um, had to build this service delivery, uh, coaching, training, setting up businesses with cocoa doctors, uh, helping them access the first 20 farmers in the village. Then let's go to the next 20. Um, that, that was, you know, ensuring that, that there were ready customers for the services that the cocoa doctors were delivering. And then uh, also we did a lot of PPP and donor funding to, to build general capacity of farmers together with the Panyulo or the uh, government extension to, to build uh, generally the, the, the farmer capacity so that they become ready customers for the cocoa doctors. Um, so I, we can only maybe Mars can say we did a lot of the blue, dark blue and in the initial years where we saw the other um, sort of spontaneous adoption happen in some of the same areas later on, maybe from the 2016 to the 2018-19 timeframe, I will have to say it has nothing to do with us because this was spontaneous adoption as a result of people seeing early success and this diffusion um, only the, the next level of the early majority, late majority happens only when A, um, affordable inputs and coaching is available, 
So there has been massive number of nurseries and set up. If I want to change my planting material, I know where to go get them. And that there are visible farmer success for them to replicate. So the conditions and the, 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 what you focus on in different parts of the, um, the technology curve is, uh, adoption curve is actually quite different. Again, it's a factor of time. If we can move to the next slide. Um, so I think um, just to sum up a lot, a number of our uh, things that I have talked about, right, uh, there are a few key lessons that we, we talk about. We have to understand we are working with small holders who are generally risk averse and they have low access to, to funding and liquidity and financing. Um, maybe some of the key lessons I would just call out are, you know, when we think about adoption, um, Let's think about ways of increasing income. Now, one is, of course, as mentioned, it's diversifying it or agroforestry, but then also um, how do we, uh, uh, seeing is believing, right? Uh, this, this use it, using the networks that's already, the networks of trust that exist in the village, show the success early, seeing is believing and letting it go uh, by word of mouth. Risk, reducing the risk. How can we as uh, businesses and, and, and the uh, look at risk reduction strategies for farmers to try it out. Um, of course, you know, crop diversification is one, but are there other tools that help to, to share the risk, crop insurance, other things like that? It's important to know your farmer. It's important, we, we say farmers, they're not one, one, you know, group of people. They have very differing, continuing, in a continuum, different needs. Um, listen to them and create feedback loops in your organization that you are able to, uh, to respond to these needs. Um, the, uh, we, we mapped every farmer, we've put in traceability tools, we measure farm performance, we, we, we tell them what it is and they can access it in their, in their phones. The second key theme I just want to, uh, we, we sort of learned is this trust in partnerships, right? Um, not just, when we say partnership, it's not just private partnership, private, uh, uh public, but also how do we build, uh, uh, extensions that the farmers trust? So getting them from within the community is great. Um, how do we create trust between the banks and the creditors and, and I mean, the, 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 the farmers and, and banks, right? We, we are still working through that because uh, farmers want flexibility and timely um, in, uh, funding, but then the banks want to manage risk. And if companies have data, we can, um, we can use that to enable a lot of uh, 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 financing options as well. Um, access to markets, right? Um, uh, price is important. Ultimately, as Pat Weedy said, you know, if, if the prices are low, it's incredibly hard to, uh, to, to intervene. So how do we create inten incentives that might tide them over premiums, you know, things like that. And finally, I think it's uh, about sustainable interventions. And it's funny because the way we started on this Coco Doctor journey was we came out from it saying, what's our exit strategy? Mars cannot be in here building the solutions forever. So we needed to build solutions that will last beyond uh, our intervention. So what are the relationships that we could build and, and tap into? Um, measure, measuring is incredibly important, not just uh, financial or shared financial measures throughout the supply chain as we create these incentives. But what are, if we talk so much about trust, how do we measure it? How do we measure it? Is it in loyalty? Is it in, uh, you know, it's, it's, and, and how do we measure it? And that's why I think you, anyone who's interested should sign up for the economic or mutuality uh, workshop and take an ecosystems approach, right? Understand that these are complex social systems that cut across social, environmental, economic, but at different levels of the farming family, the community, as well as the institutional, formal or informal. So while as a company and a, in a partnership, we can't deal with everything, we do have to recognize that there are multiple factors at play. Um, and finally, the last slide is, uh, we just want to just share, say again that we, we have done this for 10 years, we've learned a few things and we still continue to learn. And our next phase of the journey is really looking at what we call the sustainable cocoa tomorrow pillars, looking at how we can diversify income. So the great thing about cocoa is it works in an agroforestry model, perfect with rubber probably. So maybe there's an opportunity there, Stefano, and, and uh, to, to look at how can we better diversify income and really around the empowerment of women and communities and youth, particularly in Indonesia, who is an, a huge untapped potential as to how we can move forward uh, uh, with agriculture. 
so so these are just uh, by no means are we saying we've we've cracked the code on adoption and 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 all that but we're saying that we continue to to learn and we are glad to have this opportunity to to learn with you thank you thank you so much Faye, both for the really um for, for reiterating that the challenges faced by the rubber sector is not something that's unique to rubber um, and of course also for the very practical and very frank and honest insights uh, of the lessons that mars has learned over the years before we move on to the uh, Q&A section. I just want to quickly remind everybody that in order to ask questions, please use the Q&A box, which is the bottom center of the Zoom screen. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass over to Rob Hitchens to moderate the Q&A session uh, with all the speakers that are uh, from today. Uh, <clears throat> Rob, over to you and for the speakers, for a reminder, just to turn on your videos if that's okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Pranab. Uh, I see we've got about, what, 15 minutes now? Yes, that's about right. Okay. Um, I, and I've lost some of the first questions, but somebody gladly sent me a screenshot of it, so I shall do my best to navigate this. Um, I think one question maybe I'd like to start with, um, and I think I'll start with uh, Stefano, and then I will break it out to uh, Pat Whitty and then uh, Buffet, is um, the role of multi-stakeholder collaboration, you know, why is it, why is it so, so important? Um, and I guess I'd also just like to try and be a bit specific about what actually are we trying to achieve with multi-stakeholder collaboration? Because it's very easy to talk about people coming together, getting in a big tent, holding hands and singing happy songs. I think, you know, Winston Churchill once said, um, you'll never see a statue to a committee. You know, ultimately it does take, you know, leadership and people doing defined things. So Stefano, perhaps maybe you could, could, um, Start, start by answering sure. that, and, and, and then I'll go to uh, Buffet and, and, and Pabudi. Thanks, Rob. So um, I'd like to link back to the, to the report. And uh, in the case study, you identify a few areas where um, the, the company, in this case, could, could work uh, to, to improve the approach uh, towards the sustainability of the supply chain. And, and the first one that you mentioned in the case study is to strengthen corporate policy, right? I do think that there's a, 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 a benefit on having multi-stakeholder initiatives in defining what does it mean to have a stronger corporate policy. Uh, how can you have a, a better culture uh, in your organization towards sustainability and what are the targets that you define to operationalize it, yeah? And this is something that GPSNR is really working on at the moment. Yeah? Um, at the, the very moment, uh, we have uh, uh, just uh, seen a resolution that is up now for approval at the next General Assembly of GPSNR on the 23rd of September, uh, which defines policy components for companies to adopt when uh, uh, purchasing and when producing uh, natural rubber. Uh, that cover the three pillars of sustainability and are very specific yeah on uh, on the targets the company uh, the companies are to achieve yeah i do think also that there's an important part uh, of uh, a benefit on uh, working on multi-stakeholder initiatives on uh, uh, understanding uh, what are the solutions to those challenges that are not company specific challenges but are industry challenges so when we look at deforestation, for example, when we look at uh, wages, when we look at uh, living income, it's clear that if a company was to try and, and uh, specifically in a commodity like rubber, right, where you have uh, such a, a, an interchange in the supply and where the, your own supply chain as a company is not very clearly defined, understanding how you can fix it can be extremely costly for a company, yeah? To the point that if you do it and, uh, uh, and you do it alone, you can uh, get out of business uh, in a month. Yeah? So that's where we need companies to, to do this together and understand how we can face these challenges um, in a multi-stakeholder way as well as in a landscape, uh, at the landscape level. Yeah? Uh, deforestation and, uh, uh, you know, and um, uh, issues related to, to forced labor or child labor, for example, it's, uh, we, we have many case studies that show that these are not uh, uh, company specific. Yeah? So that's something where we, we can work on. Another point that I mentioned on the, uh, on, on the uh, that I didn't mention, sorry, on the presentation, but that you mentioned on the, 
on the uh, on the case study is about exploring innovations yeah on how to increase smallholder profitability yeah again here is where we can uh, pull resources together when we work on a multi stakeholder approach and this is what for example we're working on gpsnr we have a capacity building working group that has now defined actions that uh, gpsnr wishes to uh, put in place in uh, uh, in key uh, natural rubber producing countries around, for example, giving access to uh, better planting material uh, to smallholders. This is something that a, a single company cannot do uh, alone. Yeah, it would put them uh, again in a, in a, a competitive disadvantage yeah? in the industry. Or uh, looking at diversification of income. Yeah, we, we, I think that's a, a, a good example that, that uh, uh, I mean, Mrs. Faye was, was uh, bringing up uh, before about, uh, you know, how we can do cross collaboration uh, across commodities. And, and this is very difficult to do for a single company that has uh, a focus on a commodity. So perhaps so I'd like to, that's, to bring... That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, you mentioned uh, Faye, so if, if I could bring Faye in a little bit. You know, Mars seems to have been quite active in, in going out there uh, and working hard with other stakeholders to, to look at solutions. But where, where do you, just building on Stefano's point, where do you draw the line between what you do yourself and where you start to reach out, you know, where, either to other, other uh, large, um, you know, say chocolate buyers um, or, you know, specialized service providers or indeed, you know, government for planting material? Yeah, it's a simple principle we follow. So to define what's pre-competitive, that we can work openly even with uh, co uh, competitors and, and other uh, supply chain partners and what is competitive simply if we look at the principle of farmers first, if it, if it is in the interest of the farmer, it's most likely pre-competitive. And whatever research we do, you learn something in your community, let's share it. The better we are, very clear shared purpose and shared metrics of what we are trying to achieve, clear path. Yes, we do it in our own supply chains and we, how we buy and make the chocolate and all that is competitive. Clearly, we don't talk about but clearly, if we can put ten farmers at the center, farming families at the center of our, uh, of our efforts, then we are quite clear that's pre-competitive. So if it's better coaching, it's better planting materials, it's better access to financing, it's better this, better that, let's collaborate. Everybody in the supply chain benefits, not just Mars. Okay, great. Um, but but Willie, on, on, uh, if I may ask you to join here, um, on, on the subject of, uh, of engaging a range of stakeholders, the role of government has 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 emerged in several ways um, uh, from from several from several questions. So I'd be interested in your your perspective on 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 how you think that government could play a more effective role. For example, one of the questions is, um, you, you know, farmers can't sell because the roads are, are no good. Um, that would seem to be a classic example yeah. of government having a very focused role on what it can really do, help build better roads, rather than try and jump into sort of you know quasi private sector roles. Yeah, that, uh, that's true, Ram. I think it, not only uh, that it's important for, uh, for the farmer to sell their product, but the inadequacy of the road infrastructure also hinders replanting project. Because if you want to do replant, I mean, they're, uh, they're, 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 far most of the farmers are in the remote areas where there are no paved roads, right? You come in, in and you cut down the trees, but how do you take the wood out? So that's 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 a big problem there. So I think government is really important in, uh, in terms of solving the long-term problem of productivity. If you want to really do a serious, massive uh, 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 boosting up the productivity in, in Indonesia, but it's also the also the local government also can play a role. I think. Like I mentioned before, the UPPB structure and regulation has been there for 2008, but they, they, and it's in the hands of the local government actually, but they just don't know how to use it uh, effectively until the smallholders themselves uh, uh, take up their own initiative to do that. So it, 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 there, needs the, there needs to be a conscious effort by the government that, that, that they can do a lot and then, and uh, uh, what resources they have, is, they can also put it into more targeted focus. I think that will help a lot, but we need to, uh, they, they need to be pressured upon, you know, the, the mm. I think that the uh, association, the industry association, the uh, 
NGO association or, or also the GPS NAR, I, I will pressure to, to, to stay because we, we cannot solve, uh, you know, uh, for, for a massive 2.5 million people, just, just the industry alone. Now, uh, there has to be there. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, some interesting guiding principles that come out, you know, yes, stakeholder, uh, multi-stakeholder engagement and collaboration is important, but being very clear sighted on, you know, who can do what, you know, what is a, what is a commercial role for larger firms? Uh, you know, what, what actually is it that, you know, has to work for the farming business model versus what are pre-commercial roles uh, or, or temporary in, interventions that development agents might support versus which are out and out public roles that government needs to be much more focused about. And I think, you know, that seems to be a, a key lesson for making stakeholder collaboration work effectively is, is very, very clear sighted views on who can best do what. Um, we are very pressed for time on Q&A, so I have been told that what we will be doing is uh, circulating the, uh, the questions that we already have, um, and we will be providing um, some, some written answers to people who have answered, asked those questions um, back into the forum. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure Pranav also the email addresses of, of the, uh, the speakers will also be circulated if people want to follow up on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, guys. From the, uh, from the speaking side, thank you very much for your participation. And from, from the audience and the questions, uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Rob. Uh, just before I hand over to Graham to provide some summary comments, I just want to very quickly launch another poll for the audience, just so that Grow Asia knows how we can improve looking to the future when we run similar web uh, webinars. So if you would mind spending about 20 seconds thinking about your response to this, uh, that'd be sincerely appreciated. Okay, we'll give just a few more seconds. We're at 40% of respondents now. Perfect, thank you so much. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Graham Dixie, the Executive Director of Croatia, to provide some summary comments and kind of uh, draw on some learnings that have emerged from other Croatia's work across the region too. Uh, Graham, over to you. Okay. Uh, the, the first thing to say is, you know, thank you for the most incredibly rich presentations. I mean, I was scribbling down notes here. This was rich in learnings. Uh, and you could tell this by the, the number of participants went up uh, very quickly and has stayed up because of the, 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 the lessons that were coming through. I've just sort of jotted down 10, which I'm very quickly going to go through. I mean, the first one is luck has a lot to do with it. When I joined the World Bank 15 years ago, I spoke to 50, 33 World Bank project managers who really knew what projects and asked them what was their, what was, why were some projects more successful than others? And I always remember the words of a French agribusiness specialist who said, Frankly, Graham, I have designed great projects have failed and I have made bad projects which have worked. I think it comes down to the, the stars being aligned. And in this case, they had two huge problems, falling prices, which is, makes it incredibly difficult to do anything which involves additional investment. And, and coupled with that, as, as Pat Whitty points out, was, was the, leaf, um, the leaf disease. From the world, uh, uh, from Grow Africa, um, I'm, when I was discussing with the executive director there, he pointed out that one of their key lessons was that if, if, it, if a project is embedded in the CSR department, it never goes to scale. You have to embed it in procurement because CSR can be withdrawn at any moment and often it's considered not to be mainstream. So that was one that came through. Um, We've certainly found time is a huge issue. As, as um, Fefe pointed out, you know, it takes seven, eight years for a project to really play out, particularly in the perennial crop sector. So you need to be able to have time and time if you're going to change the behavior happens of farmers and impressive that they got up to 20% of their farmers doing direct sales. Then there's the issue around, um, actually a very interesting piece that at a project, at a conference they asked, People like us, practitioners in trying to link farmers to market chains, what were their lessons? And one of the ones they said, you can only work with some of the farmers. And this was a point raised a number of times 
there are only some farmers who are, are really farmers who want to be professional and we can see the emergence of a cadre of younger better farmers more professional capable of managing a larger area and taking their their productivity across a larger space certainly this is a trend that we're seeing across the region the other one was that you know if a, if a value chain is going to work everybody's going to make a profit in that and, and we've seen consistently this lack of trust about a big business coming in and wanting to work directly with farmers and very often the solutions we've seen is that those businesses have decided to use an intermediary they find the better local trader and use him as the intermediary to make things happen um, then there's this fascinating one which is that they said that function is more important than form and what they were saying here was you know sometimes it's a small trader sometimes it's a big company sometimes it's a farmer cooperative but the one thing that you can never get away from is the quality of management and being able to do the job properly. Um, probably 60% of the success of a project is based on, on the quality of management. And then there is um, a, a alluded to and highlighted by the Harvard Business School by Clay Christensen, when he's talking about that the most common failure of new businesses is that they try to go to scale before they've got the business model right. So testing the business model, and this is the point that Rob and others pointed out, and then um, but the, this, this point around economics and um, that if you want farmers to stay in here, they do need to make higher yields. They do need to get um, a higher net returns or lower their costs. And so that we are certainly seeing this emergence of a cadre of younger, better farmers, and we expect to see that continuing. And then um, there was this point, point, and it's very much sustainable development goal 17. And we've seen this extraordinarily that actually the best projects work with multiple, multiple partners. We have amongst the eight projects in these studies, we've got everything from between five to up to 35 different partners. And this is because one of the core skills the private sector has is to integrate lots of different people to create holistic solutions. And finally, my 10th one was that wonderful point made um, by Fei Fei which is that actually psychology is huge. Unless you've got the community on board, you understand who are the influencers, who's trusted, it won't happen. So I'll leave it at that. But thanks once again to Rob, to Pat Witte, to Stefano, uh, Daniel, um, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I learned so much from it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.